the mic unmuting itself, it's giving me all sorts of trouble lately. This is half the fun. My name is Jesse, everyone. I am your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and a big welcome to you. We are in our home stretch. We are in like the final five weeks of broadcast after a crazy year with over 450 sessions to date and over 50 to come. It has been a wild ride bringing you the coolest scientists, explorers, and places on this planet. And so a big thank you and welcome to our crazy amount of over 1,700 kids that registered for today's program. So welcome in across the continent. It is such a thrill to have you. And I like noting in the last few broadcasts that everything we do goes to our YouTube channel. So if you want to check this out tomorrow, three weeks next Tuesday, or 10 years down the road, you can do that and find out more and get engaged with this really incredible program we've got with you today. Now today continues our... Don't tell the other series, but this is my favorite series that we get to do every single year, and it is the Cross Canada Virtual Road Trip. We have had such a thrilling time with Parks Canada going coast to coast to coast across the country to hear stories of culture, tradition, epic landscapes, animals, and more. This is a three-part series in conjunction with the Parks Canada team and the amazing folks at Canadian Geographic. And today, we are continuing on a new little side jig of it. We've been doing a lot of animals. We started with a lot of wildlife, and I love wildlife as much as the next guy. But in the last few broadcasts, we've been going into the history and culture of these incredible places that we have across the country. We did Land of the Ancestors last week. We've got Red Bay and my Newfoundland and Labrador coming up very soon. But today, we are going to the really special Fortress of Lewis National Historic Site to learn about artifacts, these traces, these clues of people that have lived in these incredible places for hundreds if not thousands of years. And so I am really excited to turn it over to Mallory and Alanis who are going to take us on an epic journey together to explore some of these artifacts and learn about the people that lived in this very special place. Without further ado, thank you both so much for joining us today and welcome to the broadcast. So nice to have you on for our virtual road trip. This is so much fun. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, shall we just get started? You can dive right in. I'm so, I can't wait. I don't want to wait any longer. I've been waiting all day. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. So welcome everyone. We're so happy you're here with us today. Um, my name is Mallory Moran and I'm the archeologist here at the Fortress of Lewisburg. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Alanis Nightingale, who is our collection specialist here at the Fortress. So we're thrilled to have you. Um, and today we're gonna to be showing you some of the artifacts that we find here at the Fortress and talk a little bit about what those artifacts can tell us about the people who lived here through the years. So without further ado, we'll get right into it. So as I mentioned, I'm joining you today from the Fortress of Lewisburg National Historic Site, which is on the southern shore of Cape Breton Island. Um, Cape Breton is called Unamagi by the Mi'kmaq and has been their home since time immemorial. And Cape Breton is a, is a pretty dynamic place shaped by the ocean. Um, and the ocean that surrounds it has been a rich food source that has supported Mi'kmaq in this place for generations. And um, the ocean and the fishing off the shore also attracted European settlers who were particularly interested in fishing cod, which is a large species of fish that thrived in great numbers off the shore near Cape Breton and nearby Newfoundland. In fact, Lewisburg was first established by French settlers in 1713 as a place to process cod to be shipped back to Europe. But once they were here, French settlers realized that Lewisburg would be a great place to establish a permanent settlement and military base. So why did they choose Lewisburg? Um, there are lots of factors that make Lewisburg a, a very good place to establish a settlement. Um, for the first of those is that the harbor is large, deep, and protected, uh, and very good for anchoring sailing ships. And unlike many harbors nearby and in the north, Lewisburg's harbor doesn't typically freeze in the winter, so you can sail anytime. And to protect the town and the harbor, uh, French officials began building fortifications around the city of Lewisburg in 1719. The settlement was such a valuable place that it was fought over by the British and the French for many years and was at ultimately captured by the British and then destroyed in the 1760s. So this is a painting by Lewis Parker that shows Lewisburg when it was at its most busy uh, in the 1750s, when it was a, a colonial port. And we estimate that around 4,000 people lived in Lewisburg at this time year round. It wasn't just home to fishermen, soldiers, and military officers though. Many others lived at Lewisburg, including tavern owners, craftspeople, merchants, and their families. Um, there was also a very large hospital 
a school for girls, a large bakery, and many workshops. So it was a very bustling place. Um, I'll take over. Um, so after Lewisburg was destroyed by the British, the site of the fortress laid mostly abandoned for the next 200 years. Um, though people did continue to live in the area and were interested in the ruins uh, that were left behind. So in the 1920s and 1930s, interest in the story of Lewisburg really grew. And it was fostered by a family with the last name of Clennon, who were an influential Cape Breton family. Uh, the fortress became one of the first national historic sites in Canada. And the fortress that you visit today is actually a reconstruction that was built in the 1960s. Um, so how do we get from the ruins to the reconstruction? So here um, you can see three pictures of the ruins. Um, and then in the next slide, you will see what the fortress looks like today. Uh, so when you visit the fortress today, you will see exhibits about the people of Lewisburg and even reenactors in costume pretending what life was like in the, or presenting, sorry, what life was like in the 18th century. Uh, but how do we figure out what kind of food they ate, what jobs they did, or what their daily life was like? Uh, and there are several ways that we learn about the past. Uh, so the first is historical research. Um, historians learn about the past primarily by reading the written record that has been left behind. Uh, so fortunately, we have thousands of maps and documents that tell us about life at Lewisburg, uh, including everything from personal letters to financial records uh, from, to law documents and records of conflict. Um, another good resource that we have here are the lists of everything that someone owned, which was made when a person passed away. Uh, so this list is called a probate record. So we know exactly what was in some of the specific houses uh, from the kind of furniture they owned all the way down to how many spoons were in the kitchen drawers. Um, and this slide is an example of uh, Marie Marguerite Rose's inventory, uh, who was a businesswoman in Lewisburg. So when the French knew that the war was imminent, they packed up their records to be sent back to France, and this shipment kept these records safe in the archives for hundreds of years. Um, during the Lewisburg Reconstruction in the 1960s, historians were sent to France to research these archival documents. Um, so we put all that information from the documents together to get a pretty good picture of life in Lewisburg. Um, for example, when you visit the fortress today, the reenactors can tell you who lived in which house, and we know this thanks to historical research. But we also learn a lot uh, about the past from the objects that people have left behind. So archaeology is the study of the past uh, from the objects that people have left behind. There have been many excavations at the Fortress of Lewisburg since the 1960s, uh, which have enabled us to recreate part of the site. So even though we've only excavated about a quarter of the original fortified town, we have recovered over 5 million artifacts. And today we'd like to share a few of those uh, objects with you and tell you what those objects help us know about the past. Um, so as a fortified town, one of the largest groups of people in Lewisburg were the soldiers. Uh, but the life of an ordinary soldier in Lewisburg was a hard one. Living conditions were poor and wages were pretty low. Uh, so the soldiers of Lewisburg were only given a standard set of equipment. So they were given a musket with a sling a bayonet sheath, a powder horn, and a cartridge case. Um, they had to buy their own uniforms for the government or their commander, which typically were of poor quality. Um, so the bayonet was a standard tool of the soldier, which you can see I have here. So this is known as a socket bayonet, and it's made of iron and would be fitted onto the musket barrel. And it was intended for close combat fighting. Um, you can see that it has kind of a triangle shape to the blade, uh, which is stronger than other blade types. One of the other objects I mentioned was a powder horn. Uh, so a powder horn was used to call what's called black powder. So black powder was ignited by a tool that struck a piece of flint, which is this little rock looking thing here. And this would create a spark that lit the powder and it allowed the gun to fire. So this powder horn is actually missing the body, but this is the narrow end that they would have uh, poured the powder into the barrel of the gun. The wide point of the body is where the powder would have been poured in to refill. Um, originally, the powder horn issues to the garrison were made of cow horn, uh, and they were covered in brass. Uh, but they broke too easily, so they were later replaced with um, leather horns in the 19 or 1730s. Um, so here we have a part of our curatorial collection is a musket, which the interpreters use on site to reenact soldiers' life. So you could see how this bayonet would have fit on the barrel. So it would slide on like this and then lock into place. And again, would have been used for close combat. They would have taken the powder horn, as I said, and they would have poured it into the barrel like that. And then they used the ramrod to kind of compact the powder and make sure it's 
in there nice and nice and smooth. And then you can see here the mechanism that allows the gun to fire. So they would have poured a little more black powder in there and then they pull this lever back, press the trigger and it would fire a musket ball. Uh, so we put together this in the documentary evidence, uh, like suppliers lists and the records of battles and combine it with what we learned from the military artifacts that we found in the ground. And we get a lot of information about the life of the soldiers. But as we saw earlier, soldiers were not the only people who lived in Lewisburg. Uh, we find information about some of them in some aspects of their lives in documentary evidence, but archaeology and artifacts and how they are conserved help us fill in the blanks when things are not written down. So for example, uh, let's take a look at this object here. So this is a basket with uh, a quill, quill marks. Uh, this basket was found on a property that had many owners and occupants over the years. Um, the basket is made of birch bark and it's decorated with quills. And so quill work is a textile art form that has been part of the Mi'kmaq culture for centuries. Uh, and the Mi'kmaq are a group of indigenous people here in Cape Breton and all over Atlantic Canada. Uh, following European contact, quill work decorated pieces were used for trading goods. So the presence of this basket shows a trading relationship between the Mi'kmaq and people of Lewisburg. But it can sometimes be hard to identify and understand the significance of an object uh, when it first comes out of the ground. So something called conservation is usually needed. So conservation is where a scientist cleans and fixes an archaeological object. For this basket, uh, the surface dirt was removed with some water and treated with a chemical that's called polyethylene glycol, which I know is a big word. Um, but PEG stabilizes the wood and prevents it from cracking or splitting. And then we continue to monitor for it and make sure that no issues arise and clean it if it gets dirty. Um, in this slide, you can see uh, a reproduction basket that was made by Margaret Pelletier, a Mi'kmaq elder and basket maker from uh, Wigoma. And so conservation has allowed us to preserve and use this basket for interpretation on site in our Mi'kmaq interpretive center and allow for reproductions like this uh, to be made. And I am gonna switch it back to Mallory and we're gonna switch places. All right, hello. So I'm going to show you a few more objects that we've found here at the fortress and, and talk to you a little bit about what they tell us about folks' lives who lived here in uh, 18th century. And I'm going to start with this. So can you all see this here? Um, we still use these today, but this is one that was found on site that dates to the 18th century. Um, this is a thimble. And it's probably made from brass or some other kind of copper alloy because you can see that um, it's got that yellowish tone to it. Um, this thimble was found on the Duhage property. Um, the property was owned by Robert Duhage and he leased it to various individuals and families until it was abandoned in 1768. And this is an example of one of the many objects that we find on site that relate to um, the lives of women in Lewisburg. So we have some documentary evidence about uh, women's lives at Lewisburg. We know their literacy rate was quite high compared to women in France. Um, so many of them could read. Uh, we know that some were successful business women, uh, but we also know that there are lots of gaps in the written record. So for example, um, there were census data taken of the folks who lived at Lewisburg but the census didn't typically uh, include women unless they were the wife or daughter of a land owning man. And so you can imagine there were lots of folks, lots of women at Lewisburg who were not included on those census lists, including servants, enslaved people, um, and the wives of non land owning men. Um, so the reality that we have is, although some women were business owners, um, was that most women who worked at the home uh, worked as domestic laborers, which means that they cooked, cleaned, sewed, cared for children. Um, and because they don't show up in the written records in the same way, it's really through archeology span that we've determined what their roles were in Lewisburg. Um, and we mentioned that archeologists look at artifacts like the objects that are left behind. But archaeologists also look at human remains um, to determine what life was like for people in the past. 
And um, in 2019, we collaborated with a bioarchaeologist who studies human remains, uh, Dr. Amy Scott from the University of New Brunswick. Uh, and we've been working to excavate a cemetery site here at the fortress. And at the cemetery site, we found the remains of a 60-year-old woman who passed away. Uh, and by looking at the changes to the bones uh, of this person, we were able to see that she had suffered from extensive arthritis during her life. Um, which meant that she probably endured a great deal of pain and suffering. And um, from the analysis of where the arthritis was on her bones, we believe that she most likely lived as a domestic laborer and her work caused her to be in this kind of bent over position a lot of the time that contributed to her arthritis. Uh, through this work with Dr. Scott, we also uncovered the remains of a 12 year old girl um, and when looking at her bones, we were able to determine that she had a life of steady labor, um, particularly um, the way her muscles attached to the bones on her upper arms showed that she had a lot of upper arm strength and that she did a lot of labor in her lifetime that involved moving these muscles. So we can look at people's skeletons, which actually um, record their lives in a lot of ways, what kind of labor they were doing, if they had any diseases, and these, can, uh, these clues can tell us a lot about what women's lives were like at the fortress. So I showed you the, the, the thimble and I'd like to show you another sewing related object. And we also use these today. And it's quite small. It's a little pin. So you can see um, this is the head of the pin, the rounded part and the tip of the pin is over here. Um, it also probably is made from a copper alloy um, and this pin was found at the Carreau Sabatier property. Antoine Sabatier was an attorney general of the Conseil Supérieur at Louisbourg, and Andre Carreau was the keeper of stores in Louisbourg. Um, and Carreau lived with his wife, 15 children, servants, boarders, and an enslaved girl who was brought to, bought by Carreau when she was 14. So we don't know exactly who this pin belonged to. Um, but the fact that it was found on the Carreau property tells us something about what was happening on that site and what kinds of activities were taking place. And it allows us to imagine scenes of domestic life that were happening that can then um, be reinterpreted when the reenactors help us on site. Um, and one of the things that we know is that when there's, when we find objects like this pin and this thimble is that there probably was a lot of uh, mending happening a lot of sewing of clothes. Um, and one of the things that may have happened was that they may have been using pins like this to make lace. Um, and during this time period, and you can see on the lower right, there's a picture of lace making. Um, during this period, very fine lace was produced that was very expensive um, and high quality, and it was used to decorate the clothes that they would wear at the time. Um, so speaking of sewing and clothes, I'd like to show you our next object. So here we have this. And this is another object that you might use in your day-to-day -day life today. This is actually a woolen toque. So it's a wool hat, a knitted hat. And this was recovered um, from a latrine, which is like an outdoor toilet here at Lewisburg. Um, so this hat was, was knitted probably, um, at this time women would have been knitting. Uh, so you can see the wool and the stitches in the hat here. And, um, since it was recovered in the latrine, this object was quite dirty, as you can imagine when it was found. And, uh, like Alanise mentioned, it required a lot of treatment from the conservators before it could be stabilized and, um, put on this special padded, uh, mount here so that it can be handled safely. So when it was found, it was all crumpled up, it was covered in dirt, so it needed to be washed and then dried, vacuumed, and it was actually um, cleaned with a little dental pick like you'd see at the dentist to get the bits of dirt off. Um, and so finally prepared, mounted, and now it's stable so it'll, it'll be preserved for the next while. Um, and we can use it to show you uh, what life is like for folks at Lewisburg, which is pretty neat. So I talked a little bit about women uh, and, and their lives and how sometimes they don't always show up in the written record and what reasons they don't. Um, but there's a whole other group of people who we should talk about who also don't show up in the written record as often as we may have wanted. 
uh, and that would be children. So we know that by 1733, there were over 300 children in Lewisburg. Um, and fortunately for us, we do see some of the objects that children used show up in the archeological record. So the objects that they left behind. Um, and so these objects can give us some clues about what life was like for kids. In Lewisburg, most children were working by the, by the time they were 10, especially in lower class households. And so in the little downtime they did have, uh, just like kids today, they would play with, uh, with games or with toys. But because toy stores didn't exist in Lewisburg, children had to make do with whatever materials or objects were readily available to them. So we know that barrel hoops were used to, uh, to jump rope and other objects might be repurposed to make toys like bobbins um, were turned into whistles and spoons were crafted into dolls. Um, if we do see toys that are made specifically to be toys, they're usually uh, objects that are carved from wood. And these kinds of objects, because you know finding toys would be relatively rare, they would tend to be passed down through families from older children to younger children. So the first object I have to show you is this. So it's made of bone and you can see it's hollow and it's been carved a little bit. So this would have, it would have originally been a needle case and it would have been to hold those little pins that I showed you earlier. Um, but at some point in its life, it was no longer used as a needle case and it was converted into a whistle for uh, children. So you can see it's been cut at the side to make the little, the little whistle hole. Um, and I actually have another example of a whistle here that's a little bit more complete so that you can see. So just like a whistle today, there's a little notch and you would blow through this end and it would make a little whistling sound. Um, and so we have found these from time to time. Um, this whistle here was found on a property that had many different owners through the years, including some children. Uh, so, so these are little clues that folks were repurposing materials to give to kids, to entertain them. Um, and it gives us a sense of the fact that there were children on these sites uh, throughout their history, which is pretty cool to see. Um, I have another, another object here. So I mentioned carved toys. If you guys can guess what this is, it is actually a wooden sword. So it looks, a, it looks a little different, but here's the handle on this side and then the blade of the sword is here. So the, this wooden sword was found on the Benoit property and Pierre Benoit was a Lieutenant in Lewisburg and lived there with his wife and two daughters um, as well as an enslaved individual. So the Benoit family was pretty well off. So they were able to afford purpose-made toys like this wooden sword. Um, now what we see at Lewisburg um, during this period is that toys tend to serve an educational purpose. So toys are really designed to help prepare kids for adult life. And since Lewisburg was a garrison town, um, we see a lot of military inspired toys like this sword. So, so just like today you play with toys, they played with toys down back in Lewisburg. So it's really interesting to see how some things in life have changed, but others have really stayed the same. So, um, so I hope you can see here today that the story of Lewisburg is really broad and diverse and includes a lot of people, some of whom show up in the written record and some of whom we are better understanding through the objects they've left behind. Um, and it takes a huge team of people here at Parks Canada to help gather all of the information we need to interpret life in the 18th century. Uh, and this work is continuing to go on. We're continuing to learn more about the past every day. Um, so we work really hard to uncover these stories and help paint a better picture of Lewisburg for all of you who hopefully will come and visit us here at the Fortress someday. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Well, I don't know about the rest of our classes, but I'm tempted to just leave the broadcast right now and head there. I'm pretty close to Newfoundland, so I'm, I, I might be for not that long. Um, lady, thank you so much for this incredible program. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of classes joining us on YouTube, a bunch of classes live with us. 
So I'm going to give our live class just a second to like let those questions percolate. And I'll start with one because you mentioned sort of digging up uh, remains in a cemetery. And this is something that we've come upon in very few programs in our history. And one of the things is that you often need to get permission from living relatives. So I'm curious what the situation is as you're starting to learn from these bodies uh, at the site, if there's anything needed like that, or if you could explain that process to us a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, yeah, excavating human remains is a very sensitive thing and something we take very seriously. Um, and we did, uh, we we don't unfortunately have information about the descendant communities or, or the descendants to the individuals who are buried at the fortress. But in preparation for this work, we did receive permission for the work by reaching out to the churches and the Mi'kmaq community um, to just inform folks of what the what the work was going to be and to, to allow them to say no or you can proceed or anything like that. So so there was that process of um, acquiring permission before we, we went through the, the um, excavation. So yeah, everywhere is a little bit different though. Yeah, for sure. And I, I want to just add to that too, that um, the reason we are excavating this is because of um, rising ocean and uh, the coastline is basically disappearing um, and this graveyard is right on the coastline. So because of coastal erosion, it was necessary for us to um, step in and begin excavating these individuals so that they would not wash out into the ocean. Fascinating. We get like a climate change thrown into a Fortress Lewisburg. See, everything all links together. It's very exciting. Um, I've never seen a more exact opposite kind of question than that one. It was my first one than what we just got on YouTube. So I'm going to head to it first because it's so funny to me. And then I'm going to head to Ms. LeBrun's class first uh, uh, in just a second. But Ms. Wilson's class wants to know, Autumn specifically wants to know, are you allowed to blow any of the whistles? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> um, no, um, <laughs> you're not allowed. Um, so because they are conserved, um, we don't want any... We don't want spit or anything like that on them because then it will cause the object to deteriorate. Uh, we want to keep them dry in a nice uh, temperatured environment. Um, so no, unfortunately, we can't blow on the whistles, but maybe someday if we are feeling a little crazy, we might take them out and play a little tune. <laughs> <laughs> no playing with like... wooden swords on here. We're, we're just stopping. <laughs> okay, cool with the, the really old stuff. What were you going to say? Sorry, Mallory. Oh no, I was just going to say that we do we do work to create reproductions here at the Fortress of Lewisburg that we then go on to use on site, like our, our reenactors will use the reproductions. And uh, we have never had a reproduction made of, of one of these whistles, although we certainly could. Um, we have had other whistles made, so um, if you come visit us, you might hear somebody playing one of those reproduction whistles, but unfortunately, I just don't have one here today. <laughs> next time, next time. By the <laughs> way, our YouTube classes, you guys are crazy. This is like the most questions that have ever come in in like five seconds of a YouTube thing ever, so way to go. Um, Mr. LeBron, Mississauga first, come on in and take us away, grade threes. Hi. Hi. Say hi. Hi, we've hi. got Harley here. Um, hi. Hi. Um... What are some ways you can detect where artifacts are buried? buried? Artifacts are buried. That's a great question. Um, so here at Lewisburg, we usually start with the written record. So we have we have a lot of maps of the fortress that show where different properties were and different buildings were through the years. So um, that can give us a good idea of where to start if we're looking to learn more about a specific property. Um, we can look at those maps and it will tell us where to go. Um, but there are lots of times when there are archaeological sites that are buried and there's no sign that, that there was anything there on the surface. And in that case, we'll dig what we call test units, uh, basically to see what's underneath in the soil. And that can take a lot of time. Um, but that's one of the most basic ways that we that we use to, to look for sites and look for artifacts. Very cool question. Thanks, Harley. Uh, we're going to head to Miss Fogo's grade threes that are they're sharing in the chat, but I want to get them in on camera because it's just way more fun that way. So stand come up. on in, guys, and take it away. Hi. Emerson, Hi. do you want to ask the question first? Why do they make a list of the things they own after they die? Yeah. Why have the list to begin with? Great. That's a great question. Um, I'm inclined to say it's because the French were very meticulous. Um, they love to keep documentation of uh, things that were going on uh, in their colonies. Um, yeah. Uh, Mallory, do you have something to add to that? Yeah. I think it's also that um, an, indi an individual's possessions were subject to being taxed as well. So it was, it was really good to know what somebody was left with when they deceased. 
Yeah. yeah. And and uh, for inheritance purposes or if they had any debts as well, it would help them to discharge those debts. Very cool. I like that the French were very meticulous, though, as our first answer. That was great. <laughs> but that's why it's it's so great because it's, you know, that is a big reason why we've been able to make the reconstruction that we have here. Started. It's amazing when people chart their history uh, in some form or other. We see this a lot in actually South American cultures, too, where there's like these written records either in stone or string or what have you. Uh, and it allows us to learn so much more about people and places that we otherwise wouldn't have had the chance. So great question, guys. These questions are amazing on YouTube. But anyway, live classes. I'm coming to you guys first. We're going to do a, the most incredible 15-minute Q&A of your lives. So Miss Craig's class, I'm coming to you next. And then we'll head to Miss Mustard right after that. Hey, Miss Craig, welcome in. Uh, my name is Lizzie, and I would like to know what is the oldest artifact found, and what is one of the newest artifacts found? Ooh, superlatives. Let's do it. <laughs> I actually, I don't know. So we have a lot of objects that are uh, pre-settlement in Lewisburg, so pre-1713, um, that a lot of Basque people uh, left behind uh, because they were fishing here. But do you know, like, a specific object off the top of your head? Um, I would say that's a pretty good description of what it is. So yeah. probably um, from the 1600s onwards, we have we have objects that were just passed down through um, families and brought here. Um, our most recent objects, so some of the, some of the, this is kind of funny, but we do have some objects that ended up in our collections that are quite recent that were actually uh, left behind during the uh, during the reconstruction period. So in the 60s, and and so some things ended up in our collections from yeah. those uh, excavations. We have some Coke bottles, um, yeah. Fanta cans, Hot yeah. eye shirts, and uh, disco balls, and all that good stuff. Perfect. Yeah, um, but a, a lot of the um, a lot of the pre 1713 items we see are things like uh, fishing hooks, fishing nets. Um, we have a lot of like. Yeah, just general ceramics. kind of trades, things, ceramics, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Cool. Well, thanks, Lizzie, for the question. We're going to head to Miss Mustard's class next. I'll take one from YouTube after that, but I really like it. And then Mr. McClellan, uh, yeah, McClellan and Miss Carson's class, I am coming to you, I promise. But Miss Mustard, Brampton, come on in, guys. All right, this is our Nuz. Hi. Um, at that time, has there ever been a businesswoman more successful than a man? Ooh, any, like, Ooh. super cool Ooh. businesswomen in Fortress of Lewisburg in history that we know about? Nice question. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm not entirely versed on that. That would be a question for our historian. Um, I'm, I would say that um, there probably were some women who were, there were a lot of business people in Lewisburg, a lot of businessmen, and there was definitely a, a woman who was probably more su successful than a couple of them. Yeah. Um, Marie Marguerite Rose operated a tavern. Was it a tavern? Yeah. And that would have been wildly successful um what about you mallory what do you think yeah i would say there there are women who um who actually came back after the first siege and continued living and operating businesses in lewisburg so i would say they were they were successful in that regard for sure yeah and, and one of the amazing things too oh sorry about marie marguerite rose is that she was a enslaved individual um who when she received her freedom became very successful in lewisburg cool I will encourage our, our students, and this is for boys and girls both, uh, if you're keen on really amazing female historical figures, Rebel Girls is like a really incredible series online, books and more. So if you want to follow up with that, uh, that's a nice supplement to today's presentation. Uh, we're going to head to YouTube for a couple, and then Mr. McClellan's class, I'm coming to you next. Um, Mascud in Ms. Albacopoulos' class, which I nailed this time, uh, wanted to know, if there are laws around taking artifacts from somewhere, can I just come to Fortress Lewisburg and like walk away with some of these wooden swords or not? Uh, so that is illegal. Uh, no, you can't take you can't take artifacts. We all we are a federal entity too, so we operate under the government. So it's government property. Um, and yeah, no, you can't come and take anything. Um, outside of things that are not government property, I'm not sure. Morally, you probably shouldn't do that, but uh, no one's going to stop you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, well, technically under the under the Special Places Act here in Nova Scotia, if you do find an artifact, you're you're supposed to report it um, to the provincial museum, um, and that's just so that we uh, understand uh, all of our shared heritage for these various places. Because sometimes, if artifacts end up getting taken away from where they're found, we lose all of that really valuable information that goes along with the object itself, like where it was found, what layer it was found in, and all of those pieces are clues that help us really tell the story. So. It's important that if you ever do find something, you leave it where you found it and then go tell somebody that you found it there. 
every archaeology program we do, it usually comes down to the fact that like if you find something, talk to a trained archaeologist. Like talk to someone who will give you access to that sort of information because it is really important. And I'm glad you mentioned those contextual clues. If you just grab something and go, here, look what I found, you've now removed it from the place that it was found. And a lot of that information that we've talked about today comes from that sort of thing. So I'm really glad we got that question. One more quick one from YouTube. I love this from Quinn at Murray Centennial Public School wants to know. Do people in Lewisburg have pets? Are there any like dogs, ferrets, snakes, pet elephant, anything going on there? Yes, they yeah, had they pets. Um, one of my uh, we one of my favorite objects in the collection, and, and we have several different ones actually, are little bricks that have paw prints imprinted in them, and we have some for cats and dogs, and I think even a goat. Um, so yes, people definitely had pets. They had cats and dogs, um, and there were lots of other animals here on site too, lots of farm animals. Cool. cows sheep um uh, folks had lots of animals with them here this is like the greatest q a i've had in a long time this is so fun everybody uh mr mcclellan's class briar hill joining us in alberta welcome in and take us away hey um i was wondering if there's any evidence that the kids would make their dolls or they had like teddy bears or anything cool i love this question yeah I about teddy bears yeah i i haven't come across anything um like that in the collection so far um but in other fortifications or towns uh from this time period they have found evidence of um like girls making dolls out of wooden spoons um and that sort of thing we haven't found it here um mallory what are you um your phone just locked i don't know if I oh sorry just uh <laughs> Ma so mallory's phone is locked um <laughs> Yeah, no, not in particular that I found here, but also, th so those things could be hard to, um, like we could very well have a wooden spoon in the collection that was once used as a doll, and we just don't know because the evidence has disappeared. Um, I'll let Mallory speak to that a bit too, if she wants. I'm locked, here we go. <laughs> oh, hi, sorry I disappeared on you. Um, yeah, so we do we do find lots of things. Um, it's hard to say sometimes whether an object was actually made by a child or whether it was made by an adult for a child, so that's sometimes a hard question to answer. Um, but we do, I, I mean, objects like this, for example, like was this carved by a child or was it carved by an adult? We don't really, we don't really know the answer. It was purpose built or purpose made for, um, for this young person. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of a tricky question. Yeah. Um, but we definitely have lots of objects that have been modified um, and some things that could have been done by kids, like graffiti and things yeah. like that, objects that have been marked. Um, wor whirly gigs, is that what they're whirly called? We have a lot popular. of those, yeah. Yeah. I want a whirly gig. We can we can do a whole whirly gig broadcast in the future. I will note, this is I'm oddly proud of this. Teddy bears are actually quite a bit after Fortress of Lewisburg. So 1902, we start seeing the first teddy bears affiliated with Teddy Roosevelt. So some really cool history there for our American friends that might be joining today as well. But dolls have been around for a much, much longer period of time. That is a really unique question in our history as an organization. So thank you for that. Um, we're gonna head to Miss Carson's class live. And then I'm going to try and take as many as I possibly can. We are nearing the end of the broadcast, and I'll make sure all our classes have the link to Fortress of Lewisburg. You can look these things up. You can ask them. I'll ask our amazing interpreters today if they're willing to chat with us after the broadcast and maybe take some additional questions because you already have more than we can possibly answer in one session, which is amazing. So, Ms. Carson, come on in, guys. Hey. What's the most valuable object that you've got from it? Yes. What's the richest thing? What can we sell? <laughs> um, well, uh, th this is a fun story. So there is actually a shipwreck um, that happened in the Lewisburg Harbor called the Chameau. Uh, and there is actually treasure on that ship. Um, and we have a couple of the pieces of the treasure in our collection here. Um, and we do have some jewelry. Uh, not I can't I couldn't give it a monetary value, but I'm sure it it was certainly pricey back in the day. Um, Mallory, have yeah. you, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, it's just, uh, we have lots of coins, lots of jewelry, um, things that were valuable back in the day and valuable today, um, and, and things like that. Yeah, those yeah. are probably the most valuable items I think we have. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to take a few from our YouTube classes that haven't got one in yet, then I'm going to do a rapid fire round with some other classes. Miss Capwell's class wanted to know, you've talked about enslaved people a few times, where did they come from? for the site there, do we know? You yeah, um, well, we do know that a lot of them were um, essentially African Nova Scotian or from Africa, um, but there's a lot we still don't know about enslaved people at the fortress. Um, it's still very hard to find out where people's exact places of origin were, um, even in a lot of cases what their names were. 
Um, and this is something that our historian uh, here at the Fortress of Lewisburg is working to learn more about from the records that we do have. Excellent. We actually got that question twice on YouTube, so thanks for the interest classes. Uh, Miss McNamara's class wants to know, I'm sure the answer is yes. Have you ever found an artifact that you didn't know what it was? You're like, what on earth is this thing? <laughs> Every single day. Uh, yeah, there there have been quite a few days where Mallory and I have gone down a little bit of a rabbit hole trying to figure out what an object is. Um, because sometimes you just you just don't know. They get uh, they deteriorate in the ground and you can't really tell. Or sometimes people just made weird things and mm -hmm. you don't know why. <laughs> Funny thing about title that. next time. People just made weird stuff. Here it is. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, oh no, I was gonna say that uh, in a lot of ways, life in the 18th century is a lot like life today. But in a lot of ways, it's a very different place to be. So sometimes the hard part of this job is to familiarize yourself with all the day-to-day um, -day things that somebody would have used during that time period that are often quite different from what you would use today. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> I'm so happy we got this question because I think, you know, when I was a kid, my thoughts were like, scientists know everything. They're like, always oh, on the ball. Like they see our back, like, I know what that is. It's from 1759 and here it is and here's what it does. And that's not the case. It's so much discovery that goes into this and there's so much expertise that was drawn upon, not just from people there at the site, but I'm sure you collaborate with other departments to find out more about things. And it's just a really, it's a ceaseless amount of discovery and curiosity that goes into it. I think that's a really special thing with archaeology and in all sciences in general. Uh, for you too, I'm going to pick a few classes at random. I do apologize for a class that I don't get to for a second question, but I will encourage you, check out the amazing Fortress of Lewisburg website. There it is. And I'm going to email everyone this and more links when you're done this broadcast. Uh, maybe even get you a chance to send your questions in uh, after the program as well. Uh, Mr. LeBron's class, I'm going to pick you guys. Uh, I'm going to go to Mr. McClellan's class, and I'm going to go to Ms. Fogo's class, or our three at random. Mm -hmm. Let's come on in, Mr. LeBron. Hi, I've got Lily here with a question. Hey, Lily. Hi. Um, why did the British people attack? Yes, great question. Yeah, um, so Lewisburg, uh, Lewisburg's fortifications here were, um, you know, they were a major trading center. There were lots of ships coming to and fro and it was a big military base. And so it was seen, um, and there were lots of other colonists in, uh, in and around uh, New England and North America at the time um, who saw Lewisburg as a threat because when the French had their big base here, it meant that the English couldn't expand or trade freely into this area as well. Um, and so they were really um, concerned with capturing Lewisburg and basically uh, knocking it out of the picture as, as a threat that would affect their expansion in this area. So that's why they attacked both times was to, to gain control of, of this strategic area. It's really, I mean, it's really nice being Canadian now where we can look back on several hundred years of history where it's been relatively peaceful, certainly here in Canada and North America. Uh, that was not the case for most of history in this region and around the world. Uh, sort of warfare, skirmishes, battles, things like that have been sort of the standard for a long time. And we're actually in one of the more peaceful times in, in world history right now. So for our kids in Canada, it's hard to envision being attacked and having soldiers besieging your fortress. But this was a, a very standard part of life in a lot of places. I'm really glad we got that question. So thanks, guys. Um, Ms. Fogo, I'm heading to you. Mr. McClellan, we're going to wrap up with you right after that. Come on in, grade three. All right. Yokabad has a question here. Hey. Um, my question is, which animals were the whistles made of? Ooh. Those are made from bone. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so usually it was, uh, folks would use cow bone a lot of the time for, for bone like this, bone objects like this, because the cow bones are really thick and robust and there's a lot of material to work with there to do your carving with. So that's what we tend to see. And then different parts of the bone would be used for different kinds of objects. So for example, we see a lot of bone buttons and bones would be, or buttons would be made from the bones of the shoulder blade which was quite thin and ready already kind of easy to carve into a button shape so so yeah i must say i've hosted like 30 broadcasts in the last month and what animals were the whistles made of is the most unique question we've got the entire time so thank you very much for that yoga bed um mr mcclellan's class we're going to wrap up with you guys again so much learning to be done after this broadcast is done but your guys curiosity has been unbelievable in this program so come on back in guys take us away Hi, I was wondering if, like, why you would use bones for the whistles more than you would use, like, wood. Yeah. 
Interesting. Well, these bo- these whistles are made out of bones because mm-hmm. the original object was made out of bone, and then the whistle was was kind of made out of whatever object that was to begin with. So, so like so, so this object was a needle case. And you'd want to use something like bone for the needle case because um, it would stand up to constant use a little bit better than wood would. It's a little less soft and uh, and you can make something like this. So if you look at the end of the if you look at the end of the needle case, you can kind of see there's threading in there. And we actually have um, the screw top that would have screwed into the top of the needle case like this and something like this a screw top is much easier to make out of bone than it is out of wood. So bone was a really, bone was like the plastic of the 18th century. It was something that you could make into a lot of different things. It was pretty sturdy. It was very malleable. And so they used it for, in a lot of ways that we don't use it today. But uh, that would be why. That is a spectacular line. Uh, For both of you, thank you for your expertise, your your clear, unbelievable passion for this work. It's such a special place. I've shared it in the YouTube chat. I'm going to share it to all our registered classes in a minute to keep the learning going. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to you both. If there's any last message you wanted to share about this site before I bring in our classes, say a big thank you and farewell. The floor is yours. Anything to wrap up with for our kids today? Uh, just thank you for coming to this presentation and uh, watching us show off some of our cool artifacts. We really hope that someday you will get to come out and visit our beautiful site um, and see how they use our collection to re- uh, interpret the site. Amazing. Yeah, and- thank you all so much. Um, and if you want to reach out to us to contact us to ask more questions, we are always open to that. Yep. Um, I think all of our contact information is available at the Government of Canada website. So. Oh. Um, feel free to reach out if your classes have any questions. We're here to help you learn more. That's our job. So we love every chance we can get to answer your questions. Yeah, we can also, we can send our emails to Jesse too, and he can he can pass it along that way if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, that yeah. sounds great. Lovely. Well, it's on the spot now in a virtual broadcast, and now you're, you're committed to it. Yeah, and now we're dedicated to it. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, what we're going to do to wrap up the broadcast, as you know from last time, uh, we're going to bring in Miss Mustard, Miss okay. McCollum's <laughs> class, Miss Carson, Miss Fogel's class. This is the to be able to There's so many buttons to press here. Uh, there's so many buttons to press here.